Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 17th of September and this quick look at the week ahead with me, Michael Hewson. It's been a fairly difficult week, I think, to determine a direction for markets in general. I think on the whole, while European markets and, and investors in general are probably more positive than negative, it's in becoming increasingly apparent that we're looking for a bit of a narrative, whether it be positive or negative, to drive the next move. And ultimately what's happening is we're coming up a little bit empty handed. There's certainly any number of things to be concerned about. Obviously rising prices, one of them. Debates about whether inflation is transitory or persistent, um, whether the global economy is slowing and whether central banks can look at tapering their bond buying programs without sending ripples through the wider market. Um, so I think in that context, the next few days are going, to, are going to be very, very interesting because we've got the Fed meeting coming up. We've got a Bank of England meeting coming up. We've got two general elections, one in Canada one in Germany. I'm going to talk a little bit about the German election as well, even though I'll probably talk about it next week. But I think in the context of the lead up, I think the narrative for next week, um, there'll be plenty of chatter about the German election. So I think it'll be rather remiss of me if I didn't actually talk about it um, slightly more than a week out. I think as we look back at the week just gone, um, CPI, out of the US and the UK. CPI in the US is, appears to be showing signs of slowing, coming in at 5.3. In the UK, on the other hand, we saw a massive jump in CPI um, in August from 2% to 3.2%, with, with core prices jumping just as significantly. Now, a good part of that can be put down to base effects as a consequence of ETH out to help out this time last year when prices fell back. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the price rises that we're going to be seeing are going to be transitory, um, because there's certainly, I think, the potential for further significant price rises further down the line as we head towards the end of the year. And the Bank of England really does need to be aware of that. And I think it was interesting to note um, earlier this month when Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey um, was talking to um, lawmakers, um, MPs at, uh, at a select committee, that half of the MPC members appear much more confident about the UK economy than they were at the previous meeting. Um, the governor admitted that at least four MPC members felt the recent improvement in basic economic conditions could well be used as, justify, just, as justification for rate rise. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to see a rate rise at the upcoming meeting. It certainly doesn't mean that we're going to see a rate rise uh, this year, but certainly market expectations are starting to align for a potential rate rise sometime in 2023, um, or even as early as the middle to the end of 2022. Now. Yeah, so you know, pe people talk about the rate rise, a uh, rate rise as if, it's, if as if it's a policy mistake. Let's not forget where rates are at the moment; they're at 0.1%. So, um, even if they raise rates by 0.15%, which was the equivalent of the cut that we saw post lockdown, first lockdown last year, it would certainly put them to 0.25%. So, merely reversing the emergency cut that we saw just over a year ago would only really take it back to the levels that were at the beginning of 2020. Um, but I think one thing can be said is that the current level of policy accommodation can be reined back in. The central bank is currently buying around about £3.4 billion of bonds a week. There's certainly scope for them to cut back on that amount, and that could come at the Bank of England meeting on Thursday this week on the 23rd. 
there's also an awful lot of ch chatter about what the Federal Reserve might do on Wednesday. Now, just prior to the August payrolls report being released, there was a widespread expectation that this week, this upcoming September meeting would be the opportunity for the US central bank to outline the timeline for a reduction in its $120 billion a month bond buying program. Obviously, the payrolls report of 235,000 in, in August has put paid to that. Um, but it doesn't mean that it won't happen. Um, it just will mean that potentially it probably won't start until December, um, which means we need to look at the 8th of October payrolls report, which will be the payrolls report for September. But certainly the data that we've seen this week doesn't take away the argument for a tapering of asset purchases on the part of the Federal Reserve. And it's important that you look through the, the, the spin that somehow a tapering um, is likely to tighten monetary conditions. It shouldn't do that. And the reason being is the Fed is still adding to the growth of its balance sheet um, on a monthly basis. It will just be doing it at a much slower rate. So instead of $120 billion, it may reduce the bond buying to $100 billion. Now, there's little sign at the moment that any of the so-called hawks in the FOMC are starting to dial back their expect expectations of a reduction, despite the recent mixed messaging. And I think there is a fear that the Federal Reserve is becoming too complacent about rising inflation risks, especially with consumer prices still steady at around about 5.3, 5.4%. And yes, I know that the Fed doesn't target core CPI, they, they target core PCE. But even then, core PCE is still double, over double, the Fed's inflation target. So with many of the Fed members who are calling for a scaling back of bond purchases being voting members next year, the timing of a taper for me still remains very much a matter of when and not if. So in other words, we'll probably get it in December with an announcement in November, but you could conceivably get an outward, you could get an outline of a timetable maybe at this week's meeting. What's muddying the waters a little bit, I think in terms of a tapering of asset purchases is what's happening with energy prices right now. And I think that could be a potential fly in the ointment because if you get an energy supply shock, that could actually um, delay the, any intervention on the part of central banks. Um, so the autumn is going to be a very, very probably choppy time for equity markets in general. Having looked at my charts for the time being, we still remain very much in the uptrend for the FTSE 100. We've held that nice little trend line that's been in place pretty much since the lows back in January, February, and we've continued to respect it. And we've respected it for quite nicely. Uh, this week and certainly the oscillator is now starting to point to the upside so there's certainly reasons to be bullish equity markets just based on the price action you know and i think that's important i think in terms of the price action there's nothing at the moment to be overly concerned about you may hear an awful lot of narrative about that you know stocks are overvalued and what have you and obviously what's going on in asia with respect to evergrande and china is a concern um you know with 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 talk that you know evergrande is effectively bankrupt yes i mean that could well be true but that doesn't necessarily mean chinese authorities will allow it to go bust with all the inherent ripple out effect risks that uh, bankruptcy would have for financial markets in general i think given that this week just gone was the 13th anniversary of lehman i think those lessons have been well learned and a managed um, restructuring of the debt is probably the most likely outcome and even though the Hang Seng has dropped quite sharply um, what I think is significant about the fact of the declines that we've seen over the course of the past few days if we look at the, the Hang Seng is that we haven't as yet on the weekly chart really pushed much below those lows that we saw from back in August. So that's that's a very, very key support level that we've got on the Hang Seng. 
um, currently around about 24,500. So I'll be paying very close attention to that. But if you actually look at the Nick A225, for example, that's actually um, not really given up too much ground this week, although it has respected the previous peaks of earlier this year of around about 30,700. So that again is a very key level to keep an eye out for. So I think for me at the moment, we've got obviously the Nikkei and the Hang Seng going in completely different directions. Um, but Nikkei pushing against resistance, you've got the S&P 500 um, looking to hold above its 50 day moving average. You've got the UK, the FTSE 100 holding above trend line support. And we've got the DAX trading sideways. Um, now, the DAX is due to go undergo a restructuring over the course of the next few days. Um, it's going to be re-denominated to 40 stocks instead of 30 stocks. So that could actually um, affect the um, flow um, in terms of the um, money going in and out of that index. But it doesn't, you know, doesn't change the overall theme that 16,000 is still a very key resistance level overall. So the DAX will be particularly interesting in terms of the new companies that go in and the companies that come out. Um, right, so that's um, a brief look at the key indices. We've obviously looked at the Federal Reserve and we've looked at the performance of the dollar. At the moment, the dollar still looks fairly well supported. Um, certainly on the on on the CMC dollar index, finding support around about um, this trend line through here. I really don't expect the dollar to come under any sort of significant further pressure um, as a consequence of the upcoming Fed meeting. The dollar is probably still likely to move higher rather than lower, on the basis of the fact that a, a taper, you know, a tapering of asset purchases. purchases it was, is still coming, and I think the October, the September payrolls report in October will probably be, or could well be, the catalyst that crystallises a timeline for that. Um, weekly jobless claims have been still coming in quite significantly around the low 300,000, 310, 320. That suggests a fairly decent payrolls report for September, and with the um, economic stimulus measures expiring on the 6th of September, you could well see a significant rebound in hiring. I'll be surprised if you don't now that the schools have gone back in the US Delta variant um, cases notwithstanding. In terms of the pound, that's coming under a little bit of pressure um, and has been coming under a little bit of pressure, but it's still towards the top end of its recent ranges. And it is a little bit concerning to me overall that we've actually started to break below this trend line here. But I think for me, the more important line is probably less about this line. So if we remove that, and it's more about this series of lows through here around about 137.20. I think if we break below 137.20, then you could certainly make the case for further sterling declines back to around 136.20, um, 136.10, which was the lows back in August. And that wouldn't be really as a consequence of sterling weakness per se, but more dollar strength, because I still think that on, on the basis of it, we could well get a tapering of asset purchases from the Bank of England at the, the, at the upcoming meeting coming on Thursday. Given those comments earlier this month, it would really be, you know, the bar for not acting has, has changed quite significantly, I think, in terms of what the Bank of England can and will do about their bond buying program. Because if you've got four policymakers basically saying that um, conditions have been met, basically, you know, the, the improvement in basic economic conditions could well be used as a justification for a rate rise. Why wouldn't you reduce the amount of bond buying that's currently going um, into the economy? So you could you could quite conceivably, you know, reduce it completely. Um, to, you know, or, or cut it. So, you, you know, I think I, I would be very, very surprised if the Bank of England wasn't um, 
looking to outline a timeline for reducing asset purchases as well as probably doing it at that very meeting so going to be an interesting week for central banks we've also got flash pmis from germany france and the uk certainly there is um overwhelming evidence that we are seeing a little bit of a slowdown in economic activity and certainly the flash pmis are likely to bear that out for september they're due on thursday just uh, just before the bank of england meeting but just after the just after the fed meeting um but we've also got so as i say i'm not really expecting too much from those pmis other than to confirm the bias for a slightly slower pace of um, economic expansion if we look at the euro dollar chart pretty much same old same old um, it's in the middle of this range here between the dotted blue line and the lower blue line i'm still of the mindset that we'll probably drift back down uh, as one, once we break below 117.50 um, in most of my commentary over the course of the past week or so i've outlined that 117.50 area um, in fairly you know fairly major as a fairly major um, or a significant support level arrived at the 117.50 level with potential further losses towards the august lows at 116.60 on a break below it why is that significant because it was also a very decent area of support all the way through here on one two three four five six days during that particular week in july so it could well act as a decent support area from here on in resistance in and around 118.50 going forward so that's why it's important to look at previous highs and lows for areas of support and resistance they can actually be quite useful um, let's go on to the um, canadian election that could well have a significant impact on the loony or dollar canada um, that's still very much in an uptrend and the election is on the 20th now a few weeks ago canadian prime minister trudeau rolled the dice on this um, hoping it would give him a renewed mandate to oversee the government's response to the pandemic is a calculation i think that the vaccine program see him return to power with a murky majority appears to have blown up in his face quite deservedly if you ask me um, and his polling numbers have slid quite sharply now it would appear that voters have decided that it was a piece of cynical opportunism and they'd be right you know i think the last thing voters want is an unscheduled general election at a time when um, governments or the government and public services are fighting a pandemic just seeing the final cpi number there for a ucpi coming in at three percent a big jump from 2.2 so we can see that in august there was a big jump in not only european cpi but uk cpi as well let me just get rid of that um, um so i think the big question is will he be able to get any sort of majority or will he find that he's out on his ear certainly i think if he does end up out on his ear i think it would be rather poetic justice um if you ask me because he appears to have been found out i think many people are thinking that his administration is more focused on style than substance and they'd probably be right um so will it have an effect on the dollar cad unlikely it's you know the cad's been largely driven by the oil price moves that we've been seeing over the course of the past few past few days bit of Canadian strength but it's been pretty choppy fairly decent support in and around the 50-day moving average around about 125.80 but also you've got um, this support here around about 124.80 as well going forward so I don't expect to see much in the way of a reaction on the dollar cad now euro dollar on the other hand now that could be significant because obviously we have the German election um, I've written a few thoughts on it on the website you can find it here i'll also put a link to it this article because i wrote it on the 8th of september i'll also put a link to it in the week ahead so that um, you can navigate straight to it if you think the um my thoughts are of any interest personally i think it's 
it's a symbolic moment in German politics. I mean, whatever your thoughts are about Angela Merkel as German Chancellor, the fact is she's been at the top of German politics for 16 years. So she's going to leave a vacuum. Now, whether or not you consider um, that she was a force for good, it remains to be seen what her legacy will be, given that for the last 10 years, the problems she's confronted haven't really been dealt with. They've just been kicked down the road. So depending, I think, on your political mindset, she's either a political colossus who's kept Germany as Europe's most efficient economy, 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 easy for me to say, comedy, economy, or she's a political procrastinator um, who, while keeping the train on the tracks, has failed to address the enormous challenges facing not only Germany, but the EU as a whole. So I think whichever side of the fence you sit, one thing is certain, the political void she leaves will make German politics, as well as EU politics, much more complicated. Because at the moment, we don't really know who her replacement will be. At the moment, the current favourite looks like Olaf Schultz of the SPD. He's managed to pull that party around from polling numbers of 16% just over a year ago to 25%, 24-25% now which suggests that they could well be in the box seat for creating a coalition. But I think one thing is certain about German politics, it won't be an easy road to finding a new chancellor. In 2017, it took six months for the CDU and the SPD to arrive at a grand coalition. Now, there's no guarantee that that will happen this time. The Green Party has a much greater share of the vote the FDP, the Free Democrats, um, tend to be much more fiscally conservative, could well have a, a say in the balance of power. Um, and you could also have a potential uh, Jamaica coalition between the CDU, the Green Party and the FDP. Whatever happens, the Greens could well have a big say in not only you in German economic policy, but also climate policy as well. And those policy aims won't necessarily align um, with the rest of the German political spectrum. So I think we get a status quo grand coalition. That'll probably be negative for the euro. I think anything that indicates that it's going to be difficult for a German government to be formed will probably be negative for the euro as well. Um, you know, it's a big question now. Um, German politics will be in stasis for the next six months, at least. Um, the mathematics in 2017 were much simpler then. They're a lot more complicated now. So I think that's certainly something to bear in mind going forward. So, so what else to keep an eye out for next week? Well, you know, we've talked about we talked about the German election probably in slightly more detail than maybe I would have liked, but the fact of the matter is, I think in terms of the outlook, it's probably going to have a much bigger influence on the direction of the euro um, than anything the ECB says or does over the course of the next few weeks and months. In terms of um, earnings announcements, um, there's a couple out there. We've got Kingfisher. Who own B and Q? Um, their share price has been doing very well um, in recent days, and the likelihood is, despite those disappointing retail sales numbers out of the UK, um, four months of declines. Um, you know, generally they've they've been performing fairly well, and the direction of travel looks fairly positive. When the company reported in the first quarter. Um, they upgraded their guidance for the first half of the year. Um, the group as a whole saw first quarter sales rise 60%. B&Q business saw an 82% rise in sales with Screwfix contributing 42.5%. Online has been a much bigger proportion of their overall sales. As more people stay at home, do the gardens, camping, equipment and what have you, said all of that sort of stuff. Um, Although you might see a little bit of weakness in the French and Spanish business, their Iberian business, which could be a drag. 
But in terms of the US economy, FedEx is always a decent bellwether. And certainly expectations are high for first quarter numbers out of FedEx. Despite rising operating expenses, one of the things that they did say in their last update was that um, they were finding it very, very difficult um, to basically maintain delivery levels because of a shortage of drivers. Having said that, um, shortages of workers, pandemic safety measures, people are still ordering more and more stuff online. So it's really a balancing act between higher costs and, and higher revenues. Um, profits are expected to come in around about $5 a share, matching those of Q4. Given the slowdown that we saw in August in the US, though, there is a good chance that that might come in a little bit short. And then, of course, we can finish off with Nike, um, whose share price has also been doing fairly well up until the beginning of August and has started to roll over, I think, largely over concerns about its China business, which had been leading an awful lot of the gainers over the course of the um, past few months, but has now been showing early signs of rolling over, hence the fact that we started to come back down after gapping higher on that massive beat when it reported all the way back in June at the end of Q4. So certainly it's got an awful lot to live up to when it comes to the beat that we saw in the fourth quarter of last year. Can it pick up some of the, can it pick back up some of those big gains that we saw in the wake of those Q4 numbers? Okay, so um, that's pretty much um, it for this week's week ahead. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Wish you all a very nice week end. Nice weekend. Yeah, nice weekend. And um, speak to you all same time, same place next week. Well, I'll probably go over a little bit or give you an update on the German election, but I don't really think there'll be too much in terms of change with respect to that. So that's it for this week. Have a great weekend and speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks a lot.